So a very good good evening to each one of you, and I welcome all of you to the episode two of the season two of episode series which we have with Pedamorphosis. So we have really two well-established entrepreneurs who are addressing a very interesting topic today, which is uh, anti-fragile entrepreneur thriving and growing through a time of uncertainty. So I would leave it up to them to to explain to you what that exactly means and throw light upon what they want to share for an entrepreneurial journey ahead. So we have with us Mr. Praveen Kenneth. He is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Law and Kenneth, Sachi and Sachi. He's uh, at the, at a very young age. He became the youngest CEO at the Publicis Group, which is a French multinational advertising and public relations company. He has worked with eminent brands like Coca Cola, L'Oreal, Cathay Pacific, Levers, and Hewlett Packard. So thank you so much, sir, for removing removing some time and sharing your insights with us. Um, we also have with us Mrs. Uh, Lena Asha. She's a co-founder of Kabore, and she's the founder of Kangaroo Kids in Billabong High International School. She's an entrepreneur, author, and she has nearly three decades of experience in K-12 education. So thank you, ma'am, for sharing uh, some time of yours with us today to enlighten the kids. And I uh, here over want to hand over the stage to you to take the discussion forward on this very exciting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Disha. Hi everyone. So I'm here with a very dear friend of mine, uh, Praveen Kenneth, um, who's got all those books behind you to think he to make you think that he's you know very learned and uh, very well read, which he kind of is. But um, so we, we, today's topic of uh, being anti-fragile. So we all know what fragile is, right? It's something we need to bubble wrap um, to stop it from breaking. Um, you, you know, overprotected kids are fragile. So for kids who have had parents who've done too much for them, too much homework, too much sorting out their problems, um, too much of a tranquil childhood. Um, if your parents are watching, you've wrapped your kids in bubble wrap. It's not so great. Your kids will go into the world being fragile. The challenge with this is that life is bound to throw challenges your way. Um, you know, so parents, while you think you're being kind to your kids, when you bubble wrap your kids, you're actually being cruel. So my son used to say, uh, yes, mom, I know you're being cruel to be kind. And sometimes that unfortunately or fortunately is what we have to do as parents and teachers. We do have to be cruel to be kind to our kids. So, you know, today children increasingly uh, can tolerate less discomfort than they ever have been able to. And, um, you know, they have negative reaction to the world around them all the time. Teen suicide rates are rising. There are many, many factors, but the main one is that the entire uh, foundation of our culture discourages resilience. We are given clear messages by the media that the world is a scary place and that we need things, people, strategies to protect us from the terror that surrounds us. In this way, in some way, we're being brainwashed to develop a victim mentality. Apart from this, we're constantly learning that everything that makes us uncomfortable is bad and that there's always an instant fix around the corner. And you know, we, we, we've also been taught to distract ourselves with technology, um, with the overabundance of uh, media. And we can do this and you know, we feel that if we fix our lives and we distract ourselves, we can find um, instant happiness. So Praveen, or better known uh, um, endearingly to us as PK, uh, PK, I know, I know, you know, we both had kind of like a middle class childhood, right? And I believe it kind of served us in great ways. Um, I don't believe you had a bubble wrapped childhood. And can you talk about your childhood a little bit? And then again, your early young days, living, uh, you know, your early young man days living in the YMCA. And how do you think this helped you as an entrepreneur because obviously you're not fragile. Well, hi, uh, thanks, Lena, for having me over today. Great to chat with you and with the rich the month people. Uh, so, uh, I like this conversation, and I've been thinking about this in the last 24 hours, saying how to make sense of this uh, one hour conversation, uh, teacher. Um, talking about anti fragile, uh, when I grew up, my sister was unwell for a long time. So knowingly or unknowingly, my parents were very busy with her. You know, she was five years older to me and she let me, and so my parents let me fend for myself basically, which actually wanted to be a blessing uh, in many ways, right? When I grew up, I still remember when I was seven or eight, I felt my parents were too busy with my elder sister and not with me because there was no attention uh, for me, uh, right? So I felt pretty left out. And when I grew up, I realized that was the best gift my parents gave me, knowingly or unknowingly because I had to step up and look after myself, uh, basically. 
so my mom being a teacher was extremely tough on me, like exactly the way you talk about Drish, your son. Uh, she expected me to just show up each day, right? So nothing was, nothing was granted in my life. Uh, I had to fight for it, I had to fend for it, and uh, nothing was easy. Nothing came uh, on a platter. And I'm 50 now, and I look back, I believe those are the very things that actually made me uh, become the person I've become right now, because I came from a system uh, that was not always serving me. Uh, uh, everything had to be earned. Everything had to be worked hard for, um, which I thought was very cruel. Uh, but those are the things, teacher, that actually made me who I am today. Uh, I, had to, I had to go out there and make something out of everything. I had to fight for every single thing that came my way, basically. So uh, whoever's watching, you know, you, you, you teenagers, what I want you to understand from what Praveen just spoke to us about, it's such a powerful lesson he just gave us. Um, he had a situation um, that happened to him, but he chose to say it happened for him. Right. Right. And he chose to change it from, um, you know, he could have chosen to be a victim and say that, oh, my parents didn't have time for me, but he actually changed the story in his head and how powerful that is that he chose to see himself as, you know, being served by what happened to him, being served by the fact that his parents couldn't give him all the time, being served by the fact that he had to show up and he's taken that as the greatest blessing he's ever had. So one of the greatest things uh, Praveen has just spoken to us about is that everything that happens to you What's really important is the story you tell yourself about what happens to you. Would that be correct, Praveen? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So true, so true. So, so true. I tell my brothers, uh, Praveen, that you know I think the greatest gift we had was that both my parents used to work from morning to night, um, right. and and we had to fend for ourselves as well, right? right. And right. Um, you know, for us, the biggest treat was having a McDonald's burger or a McDonald's meal on our birthday. Right. You know, that was a treat. And mango season, when mango season came around, we could only afford to buy one mango and that would be cut five ways. Right. The beauty of this is that today, while I have an abundance, financial abundance that I've right. developed, um, right. I never take it for granted and I'm always grateful right. for the mango that I eat. Right. Or even, even the McDonald's burger that I eat, you know. Yeah. I, I'm truly grateful for it. And we all know when we exude the feeling of gratitude, Right. how many happy chemicals that kind of releases in our system right, right. so right. For, for you kids watching you know every opportunity um you you can't create happiness but you can you can through uh, being grateful you actually create your own happiness okay right. so now we we've kind of discussed I, what I, yeah i, I should quickly add something there teacher because uh, you, me, and, uh, and the parents uh, are the kids of the 80s. We came from the from a world where there was very little. Just one pair of jeans, one sneaker brand in the country, right? We had nothing. The world was different. India was very different. Uh, the world that the kids are today is there is abundance, like you said, right? So there is so much to choose uh, and everything is available. Uh, that, that for me is, is a challenge because parents provide everything for a child. And I think parents actually take away the joy of earning from the children at a very, very early age, uh, teacher. This has been my conversation with many of my friends. The children is that bringing up children with love, which we actually candy floss with privilege, uh, unknowingly, because we want to give the best to our children, but unknowingly, we actually take away the reason and the purpose for the child to exist. Yeah. Uh, when I first made my uh, first salary uh, when I was 20, when I got my first thousand bucks, when I went and bought myself a pair of shoes, that was the biggest thing I could ever think about for myself, right? Uh, one of the things I actually want to leave in this conversation is if we as parents become very conscious that uh, there's something called love, but love can also be extremely selfish, that we give so much to our children unknowingly, but in the bargain, we actually take away the wings from them for them to fly, for them to dream, because you fulfill their dreams rather than rather than they going out and fulfilling the their own dreams. Am I making sense, teacher? Absolutely. So 
there's for all you uh, watching, there's one TED talk you must watch from what uh, PK just uh, told us. It's called The Paradox of Choice. And, right. it's, and it actually shows you how having more choice isn't making your life easy. In fact, you, you overcomplicate it in your head. Right. The second thing that I'm taking away, you know, uh, uh, that's coming to mind from what PK is saying is, you remember when we used to only have one movie on Sundays? Right and Chaya Geet on Thursdays, and how the whole family would congregate around the right. television set to watch that Sunday movie. Sure, 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 and, yeah. now, and now we've got Netflix with multiple uh, options, mm -hmm. and, uh, endless sure. options of things to watch, and yet we get so confused about what to see, right? right. right. <laughs> so that's the paradox right. of choice. So I encourage all of you who's, who are watching to actually watch the TED Talk around the paradox of choice. So now, um, PK, we, we, we've spoken about what being fragile is, right? And you, uh, I, I'm going to ask you to speak about your YMCA day, YMCA days, days still. So let's look at a word that's being used very much today, especially in the context of the pandemic. So it's being, you know, the, the state of being resilient. So I'm just going to explain quickly what resilience is to, to the kids who are watching. It's a, a neurocognitive characteristic and it, so it kind of gives us the ability to bounce back from stress. So you see like this palm tree that's swaying and there's heavy storms and it bends and it kind of lifts back up again. That's right. being resilient, right? It's something that we need as an emotional state when we fall, when we fall emotionally, financially or physically. And, and you know, we have to just kind of dust ourselves and get up again. So being resilient is very, very important. And it's a little bit more than that. It's, it's developing resilience is really important to living a successful life um, because you're more likely to take healthy risks. And we're talking about, entre we're on a uh, platform talking about entrepreneurship and we all know as entrepreneurs, we do have to take healthy risks. Um, people who are resilient are brave, curious and trusting of their instincts. Um, and that's why they're more likely to find success in entrepreneurial ventures because to have an entrepreneurial mindset, you necessarily have to be resilient, right? And an entrepreneurial mindset, if you do, even if you don't go out to be an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial mindset is what all forward looking companies are looking for, like Amazon, Google, they're looking uh, for that when they hire you. So um, resilient people are also less likely to be depressed, which is really important, right? right? So, and and the, the, what the research shows in this area, a little bit like what PK said earlier, that we need to allow our kids to have mini challenges and experiences as they're growing up so they can build their resilience muscle. So if when, when the big challenges come in their life, they will have the antibodies, you know, the thoughts, the beliefs and the mindsets that they'll need to be resilient. So unfortunately, as PK said, you know, we, we've kind of been teaching kids not to have painful feelings and we've been over providing for them. Uh, and as parents, we have to understand that we cannot be grateful for water unless we've experienced thirst. Or as the Dalai Lama says, pain is what you measure pleasure by. That if you haven't known pain, you actually can't measure pleasure. So we have to accept and embrace the fact that there's inevitable pain of being human. We will all suffer at some point in our lives. And our kids will also suffer at some point in our lives. We'll all feel the loss of people or of things or of you know, material stuff that we've collected. It is the single human experience that is guaranteed. And I'm just telling to, this to parents, you know what, my son, I was in, in, um, in uh, uh, Asia and you know, the, 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 the Air Asia crash, plane crash that happened. Trish actually thought I was on that flight, my son. And he called me up and he was sobbing over the phone. And he, mama, if you die, I'm gonna die, if you die. And, and I was, I said, oh my God, what have I done? I have not taught him to cope with my loss. This experience is now going to help me to teach him to deal with my death while I'm alive. And I've actually used that experience to help him to deal with my death. And hopefully when I do die, he's not going to feel, he's not going to feel like his life has ended because, you know, I keep telling parents, our job is the same as every animal on the planet. It's to make sure that our children are one day closer to independence, thanks to us being alive. Right? So, and we all know that the unexpected, the uncertainty is part of our life, Praveen. So I know you've done a lot of work in this area. Um, what are some of the key things that you have imbibed in your life as an entrepreneur that has helped you embrace uncertainty as a part of your life? So it's interesting. Uh, I've always believed this and you've spoken so much about this, uh, Dina. I, I think we need to have serious conversation about the joy of failing uh, because, because I think that's one word that Nobody wants to have, uh, nobody wants to even have a conversation with, with 
I mean, I, I have I have been in family dinners with my cousins and and, and kids. It's all about being successful, uh, right? We don't prepare our kids for challenges. Uh, we don't prepare our kids for adventure. We only prepare our kids to be successful in the material world, be it or, or academics, uh, right? So, I think, and I think it's cultural. We have never celebrated the joy of failure. And if you look, if we look at any business, any successful entrepreneur, anybody from Steve Jobs down to Elon Musk, right? It's all about failing. Uh, I fail. I mean, I fail a hundred times every day, and each time I fail, it's a great way for me to kind of get up and become something better. I learn so much in my failure, right? I wish parents can actually make this a conversation, and even kids actually own this conversation, saying that each time I fail, which means I'm actually getting closer to victory, rather than saying I'm going to avoid failure, I'm going to avoid uh, pain, because you cannot avoid. Pain. It's like it's like being in a storm. You, you're being in a being in the ocean. You're on a ship. There are going to be great days. There are going to be storms. In the ocean, there's there's a storm every four hours, five hours. Uh, life is life is like an ocean, right, uh, teacher? It's uh, but we don't train our children. I mean, if you look at all those cases of kids committing suicide, unfortunately, it's because we don't yeah. train them that failure is actually the stepping stone for all your successes. And, and, and that goes back to anti-fragile is that you can only be anti-fragile when you learn to come back up. It's not the number of times you fall, it's how well you get up, how fast you get up. And, uh, I, and I think if we can actually make this a part of our daily conversations with children and with young adults, I think that, that that'll actually change humanity, uh, teacher. Uh, failure is one of your best teachers, he's been my best teacher. Uh, every no has made me the person I am. And I go through a no a million times. It doesn't really matter when I was 30 or 20 or 19. Even now, even at 50, when I do stuff, I'm, I fail. Uh, uh, so I think if that can become a part of children's conversation, parents' conversation, and celebrate the joy of, of, of failing. I think, I think the kids have a great time growing up. So one of the things you just said, Praveen, and I want to uh, reinforce this because it's such an important thing you've uh, touched upon for any parent or teacher or student watching this, uh, watching us today, is that, you know, we've, um, uh, Carol Dweck has written a book and a whole, uh, uh, it's almost like a research thesis on a growth mindset that the, because, sadly, because of the way our education systems have been set up, right. you know, we've grown up thinking that intelligence is fixed. Creatively Absolutely. fixed yeah. because we yeah. get an A plus or we get a uh, or an F minus, and we right. think that that is you know that is actually where we are in the construct of um, our growth, and it's yeah. not so. So you know the joy of failing is something that we need to embrace so much. Um, I've sold my schools now, but when I was running my schools, I had this thing that I would call one grade up, which meant it, it's like real life, right? It's like playing a video game. You start right. off playing a video game at a certain score and you can only get better. Right. Right. Because each time you play, you get better. And it's yeah. one of the reasons why kids are so addicted to video games because video games don't judge them. Video games do not fix their intelligence or their effort. You know, it kind of keeps rewarding them for effort. And that's what we need to do with kids, not reward them for the outcome, but reward them for the effort that they put in to get better. So one grade up was an opportunity where if you sat any assessment, you could sit it again and again and again till you got the score you were happy with. And so, you know, in a, in a, in a education system that's so stuck in the status quo, you know, people would fight that. They'd say, no, no, but if someone's got 90, they shouldn't have to sit it again. I said, no, if somebody's got 90 and they, they were aiming for 100, they should be able to sit it again. You right. should be able to like life. Life gives you multiple opportunities to do oh, something till you succeed at it, right? To, to get. So, uh, Praveen, can you speak to one specific instance in your life when you failed? And what were the learnings you brought through it that have remained with you till today? Right. I've had many failures, Lena, so I just can't pick up many special ones. I think everything has been special for me. Uh, uh, if I could actually pick up one uh, one stuff was uh, 
in college, uh, uh, I, I was there to begin uh, working. I'd taken my friend's bike and unfortunately I crashed the bike. So it was, a, it was a good bike, but I went back and gave him a broken bike. So I basically failed uh, being a good friend because I had crashed a bike. It was expensive. Those days, crashing a bike was not an uh, intelligent stuff because it cost you, you know, 60,000 rupees, which is a lot of money in those days. Uh, for me, it was, it was a wake-up call, uh, teacher, because it was my inability to actually go back and give the bike. For me, I had failed. Uh, my relationship with buddy is being so careless with them. So that was, that actually was the tipping point in many ways to the person that I became because I realized that I had to be responsible when I when I take on uh, somebody's uh, uh, respect uh, to give give me uh, give me their material stuff. Uh, I've gone through this stuff when I when I began my company. Uh, we began in London and me and Annie Law, you know Annie Law, we began in London, Kenneth, and we began this company and. Uh, we were actually supposed to make uh, uh, the final closure of a company in the US. And we were all set, we raised the money and uh, we also had a party uh, a week prior to make sure that we knew the deal was done. Uh, exactly a week later, the entire stuff fell apart. Now I'm talking about 18 years ago. And that, that failure in many ways uh, made Law and Kenneth Law and Kenneth 18 years ago because we said, we cannot take anything for granted till the last minute, right? So there are many failures, but one underlying factor is that it's always given me a chance to think better and be better teacher. I think I've always seen that say, that, okay, now what is it that I need to do better? What is it that I, that I did, or I didn't see, or I didn't judge right, I didn't see right. It gave me a chance to recover, recoup, relook at the plan, and redefine my plan. And that's the reason I, I really I embrace failures so easily. Uh, and many people ask me, how is it that we, we became so successful? I think we became successful because we were able to adapt to failure very, very fast. So Praveen used a lot of re words, you know, re look, redefine, um, you know, um, one of the very important reads that he spoke about without using the word is reflect. Yeah. So Absolutely. I'd like all of you watching to understand the process of reflection is one of the most important uh, ways of thinking that you can ever uh, have. And what I'd like to encourage parents to do is next time your kid comes home with an assessment or a project um, completed, um, instead of saying, why did you get such a low score? Uh, it would be a lot more helpful uh, for you to ask your child, what would you do differently next time? Absolutely. Right? Yep. And that would be so much more a powerful way of parenting than saying, right. why did you get this wrong? Or why did you do it this way? Um, you know, what would you do differently next time? What could yeah. I help you do as a parent to help you, you know, overcome this? So uh, Praveen, we've spoken now about fragile and we've spoken about resilient. Right. And uh, so the resilience is the ability to bounce back from fa failure. Now I want to look at what being anti-fragile is. And it's fascinating because um, this concept is very dear to my heart. I recently read a book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb and he's coined this term uh, anti-fragile. And he uses this term to describe people or organizations or whatever that not only do not break under stress, right, which is what is being strong, not only bouncing back from stress, which is resilience, but actually growing and benefiting from volatility and shock. So actually benefiting from stress. And, and these are Nassim's words. He says, you know, wind extinguishes a candle and energizes fire. Right. So for all of those who, of you who are still young enough, you want to look at randomness, uncertainty, and chaos as a opportunity to help you grow and develop. So what I want to encourage all of you to do is to be the fire and to wish for the wind. So Praveen, the world as we know it has changed, right? So we're all sitting in this time of uncertainty. Um, um, and, and now what remains to be seen is not just simply, you know, which one of us will adapt, but which one of us will use this time to successfully evolve, right? To thrive because of the uncertainty. 
um, right. can you speak to yourself or someone you know uh, or an organization that has shown itself to be anti-fragile that's actually used this time of the pandemic to find new ways to grow and thrive so uh, there are two parts to this conversation the first part is about anti-fragile anti-fragile doesn't mean that you can't be fragile the truth is we're all fragile teacher i think that, that that's that's the core of it if we all actually begin our conversation saying that we are fundamentally fragile human beings we are human beings basically right we can break with that if we realize that that is the starting point to say that how so if, if that's the case in point how do i now strengthen myself constantly to make sure i can actually create learn new ways to make sure i create some sort of a system to make sure I'm able to counter being fragile more often than necessary. Right. So for me, so for me, fragile, so you have, we are fragile. You got to just learn to become stronger uh, each day. I think uh, six months is too short a time to actually pick up and say, uh, is there any organization or, or any institution or any individual who's actually trying to work? I, I think all of us, I think all, Everybody, every single human being, the 7.8 billion of us are actually trying to see this new challenge very differently, teacher. Every exposure, every conversation I've been a part of in the last month or two, uh, nobody has an answer. Uh, nobody has a vision to say, wow, what next? I think all we are saying is, let's take it one step at a time. This is not new to humanity. It's not new to you. We've been through chaos, right? It's uh, we've been through enough chaos through thousands of years that we've had wars, we've had plagues. This is this is hugely different because it's actually enveloped the entire universe, touching each one of uh, each one of us. I think it's it's I think it's an evolving process. Um, I think what I am seeing, and I I can sense it with every conversation, every board meeting I've been a part of, is there is a desire to say we got to fight it. Uh, we got to see it through. Uh, they, I think humans actually step up when they are actually pushed to the corner. Uh, so uh, with the backs uh, on the wall, uh, all I'm sensing is there is a sense of we have to overcome. It's a great human spirit. Uh, that's the pioneering spirit of hum humanity that's actually driven the world uh, forward. Progress is eternal uh, as we look at it. Uh, I see a very different bunch of people being more centered on saying how can we actually build a better world around us uh, rather than building better business i think that's the shift that i'm seeing it's not about making bigger companies and bigger organizations say that how can we better be better as human beings uh, in a changing uh, environment uh, today teacher so i see a lot of optimism in the darkness uh, it is darkness. Let me let, let's be honest with, it, with all truth. It is darkness in the business world. It's darkness. It's it's it's, it's challenging, but I believe human resilience to overcome uh, these things are inbuilt. It's in our DNA uh, from our flight to uh, flight days. We've always overcome challenges. So, yeah, I I think we will come out of it stronger, and hopefully more uh, more gentler. Okay. So um, you said there's two parts. Have you explained both parts? Yeah. yeah. So the first part was defining what fragile meant for me. Uh, okay. Because fragile, uh, for me, fragile was uh, doesn't mean that you're not fragile. The, the truth is that we are all fragile, right? Everything is fragile right now. It's, it's how do you build resilience to make sure you become stronger and strengthen yourself? Not being fragile. The second part is the question was how is the world evolving in this uh, in this uh, in this change? And I said it's too early to to actually create any organization that's actually evolved but for a business reason if you look at a business reason the one brand that's done extremely well is amazon but because it's actually serving a larger cost but i don't think that is a a conscious decision it's a service mode uh, just because it's been valued at 1.3 uh, trillion uh, doesn't for me it's not it's it's got nothing to do with the pandemic it's it's feeding into a service economy but i think i i, I believe there'll be many stories in the next six to eight months time of of new stars who actually saw through the pandemic and came with some great stories. So I'm just going to talk to um, the kids who are watching about my experiences of being anti-fragile, right? So given the core purpose of what I started out to do, which was to touch as many kids' lives in India as possible, um, 
anytime you know um, a, a thought process was copied or you know replicated or it created inspiration for somebody else in some way you know my team would run to me and say um, lina lina you know this is happening and i'd say we're here don't forget the the initial cause which is to reach out to, to as many kids as possible um, then you know this uh, school started poaching my teachers because my teachers had a certain amount of ip in their heads about the instructional design process that i would follow which was you know which was our uniqueness of how we used to teach and you know uh, principals would run to me and say lena 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 you know people are poaching our teachers and it's really bad so instead of thinking of it negatively i actually set up a teacher training institution as part of my business right i started developing uh, when people were copying my um, um, worksheets i started developing workbooks and selling them in the open market so I, what i want kids to understand that being anti fragile is to look at any chaotic situation or anything that you believe is a thorn in your side and saying can i use this to grow and thrive in some way by just shifting the way i think in 2006 i used to only franchise my schools and in 2006 um i was hit by a franchisee shutting its doors on me and owing me a lot of money and my company would have gone under right but because you i kept on thinking that what is this time come to teach me in which way can i use this as an opportunity to grow and thrive and it actually pushed me out of my comfort zone and actually had to go and build, i went and built a brick and mortar school and started operating it rather than just serving schools um you know as a consultant which i was doing in the franchising mode so i had to build new muscles and new skills to do that now what are the things i want to excite kids about today is that because um access to information and learning is just so abundant that today nothing stops you not money not anything as 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 much as you're intrinsically motivated to learn and grow the world is at your fingertips i want to excite you to do that that the only way forward is to constantly learn and grow right so we're here to talk about entrepreneurship and so entrepreneurship by its nature is a disruption seeking enterprise right oh, how do entrepreneurs come about um because if everything were consistent proven and complete entrepreneurship would not exist right it it in today's you know day month year we have a lot of good students in the world a plus students but most of them are unable to handle ambiguity and the very nature of being an entrepreneur says you have to be able to handle ambiguity so the tragedy of overprotective parents those that try to help the most often hurt their kids the most because you know their kids cannot cope with the ambiguity so to understand the future you only need to be aware and curious about what's happening around you today um just as the success of netflix tells you a lot um you know aspirational entrepreneurs don't need wealth today anymore to build an enterprise or the entrepreneurial dream or venture the potential to disrupt industries and corporate giants has never been greater than it is today thanks to technology so praveen i want to come into your present day right right um right. you know from an and i i know some of the work you're doing so from an analog conventional advertising agency which you sold in the nick of time right i don't think you'd be ever saying thank you thank you universe for sending me signals signals to sell my enterprise and from me running brick and mortar schools which again thanks to you i sold in the nick of time <laughs> when you know when i got offered a great offer for selling my company I actually went to praveen because you know one of the frailties of entrepreneurs one of the fragile things about entrepreneurs is we get emotionally um um attached right. to yeah we get attached emotionally to what we've set up it becomes like a baby right and then we yeah. we we don't want to get let go of it and so when i got an offer to sell kangaroo kids in billabong high i actually went and had i said praveen i need you to take me out over a bottle of wine and some meat, some dinner and i need you to talk to me and i actually remember sitting across him and asking him this is the offer that's come um to sell the company this is how i feel in terms of you know emotional attachment um should i sell or not and he just said sell and because i have so much faith in praveen and his uh, you know foresight and vision i actually sold my company and again i never say thank you to the universe as much as i do in these last 6 months that uh, you know so um i'm using technology now as a way to reinvent myself um you know um one of the things that i didn't enjoy about running schools is that no matter how much of eq i try to teach kids by the end by the time it came to grade 9 10 11 12 all the parents 
were pushing for grades and scores, right? And the kids were immersed in this horrible rote learning thing of getting the grades and scores. So I'm using technology to reinvent the understanding of human potential, uh, for, you know, by getting parents to understand it um, and building an online learning platform, right? Um, can you tell us ways, Praveen, in which you are using technology to reinvent yourself? And where do you see a new stint as an entrepreneur going? Right. So, teacher, I just, I just want to just go back to the uh, earlier conversation uh, because we're talking to young kids today, and I want to make sure both of us are actually leaving something behind for these young teenagers and young kids today. I believe that, one, we need to dream. We need to allow and we need to actually encourage our kids to dream a lot. Uh, I see this conversation getting lesser and lesser, uh, teacher. I don't know if that's been your exposure, but I see uh, the world is, is all about creation and the world needs creators, right? It, it, it's not about how big or how small, but the entire attitude of creating constantly. Uh, I think if, if, if the children and the kids and the teenagers listening to this conversation, it is one thing I would really call on and to both the parents and to them is dream. Uh, learn to create because the one thing that you can actually make a difference in this universe is is, is your creation because that's a you are a creation and what can you create that can, that can actually make a change and that's all that's all about being enterprising that's the reason that the word called being an entrepreneur is is that to set on a venture to set on a journey to set on an adventure to create something that you have dreamt of basically right uh, being, an, being an entrepreneur is all about being uncertain. There's not even a single day life is certain. Uh, it's a storm uh, every day, right? So be an entrepreneur, but let's, let's be very clear. For every thousand company that begins today, just two survive in the next five years. That's, that's statistics, right? This two or three survive in five years, right? So. It's a tough job and it goes back to the conversation saying that if you're going to be fragile when you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's not going to work. Uh, but if you're, going to, if you're going to celebrate the joy of, of failure and welcome storms every day, you'll be an extremely brilliant entrepreneur. Uh, so, uh, so for me, that, that, that's, that, that's to kind of cover what you uh, said earlier. Uh, I want to be clear that I, I got this right is that, yes, uh, the world around us is, is changing. Uh, when, you, when somebody says that you are a serial entrepreneur, it actually means that you have failed often uh, because with every, every single enterprise. And that's why it's called a serial failure. Uh, if you really look at it, Richard Branson, uh, Sir Richard Branson was actually consider, considers himself to be a, a serial failure because he has failed in so much more. Uh, and we all celebrate his airline and his telecom business and his space shuttles. But Virgin Mobile fail, Virgin TV fail. I mean, name it. He's had, he's had more failures than anybody can really think about. Uh, if you look at the way the world is evolving today, uh, we if if we need to be relevant, we need to be relevant five years from now, not to where we are in the world today. Uh, we need to have the ability to sit and say, what will the world need three years, four years, five years from now? And, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's a tough journey. You'll never be able to get there in one single shot. You've got to evolve, right? The Apple phone, I don't think Steve Jobs, when he began in the, in the 70s, ever dreamt that he's going to build a phone because nobody had a concept of how can there be a phone? It was an analog phone. Uh, but, the, but the company evolved, right? He, he, from, from computers, he actually wanted to be more into television because Sony was dominant in television. Uh, it, it's an evolution and the ability to be able to see where will the world be in the next four or five years, teacher, right? Uh, that comes from you allowing uh, yourself to be exposed to a lot of new stuff that comes your way. And, I, and, and this is a conversation I keep having with, uh, with a lot of my friends. There is a difference between knowledge and intelligence. Right, because and there's common sense. Uh, intelligence is just reading, uh, but common sense and, and and acquired knowledge will actually prepare you to understand where the world is moving. Uh, so uh, it's a learning for me, uh, Lena. Uh, it's the learning for me. Uh, I, I I am learning every day. I'm a student every day. Honestly, when I look at digital the, the, the digital world today, from from moving from advertising to digital, 
I'm in ground zero. I'm in low, kilo, low kg where I began eight months ago. I'm catching up. But uh, you begin at ground zero. It doesn't matter how successful uh, you are, how much you sold the company, you, you begin at ground zero with anything, uh, right? So I'm learning every day. I'm a student every day. I get up in the morning and I've got a bunch of kids who are 23, 24 years old. Uh, and I'm an old man, but they teach me uh, the world of, of, of the app world, the digital world, the coding world. So it's a learning. It's a learning teacher. Every day is a learning. So talk a little bit about what you're doing now with the embracing of technology, um, you know, in your new entrepreneurial journey. Right. So I don't know if I can, I can speak about many, but I can just speak about a couple of stuff that I believe uh, what's going to drive the future. Uh, one is uh, data. Data uh, as a conversation has been much abused. Uh, data means what? So big data and the big data, it's, it's rubbish, right? Because it, it's, it's, it's become an intellectual conversation. Uh, I think uh, my, my belief coming from advertising background is to be able to understand how people feel because I'm in the business of understanding how people feel because in benefit people only buy something if they feel good about it. People want to listen to this conversation if they feel that there's something nice to learn about the entire stuff, right? So we, we use very big words like AI and big data and coding. I, it comes back to one simple stuff. Can you connect with people? In the NFL, life is all about connecting with people. Uh, true success in any business comes when the idea connects with people, uh, basically. So, uh, so all so the couple of stuff that I'm engaged with right now, the core of it goes back to common sense. But I'm, I'm but I'm using the world of technology to be able to bring that to life, right? So, uh, I, I, I'm trying to figure out models uh, in a couple of my business saying that. If, if my job is to make sure I understand how the consumer feels and because of that, I'm actually able to understand what he needs in his life. It could be a pair of jeans. It could be a, pair, a brand new car. If I can understand the way he feels and that is all, I mean, if you can understand the way people feel, that's, that's a billion dollar uh, world out there. And, and it's, it's, it's a hit and miss right now. So that's... So I just so want to summarize what you're saying is you're saying people don't buy a thing. They buy a feeling or how it makes them feel. All of us, all of us engage with something we feel for. Life is all about connection. People buy iPhone not because it's a great phone, because they feel like iPhone means something. When somebody buys a Ferrari, they feel something. When they buy a Rolex, they feel something. When they, when they wear a pair of Nike, it's because they feel. And this is what I want to tell all the kids out there. Anything you do out there, use your mind to grow. But keep one thing in mind. Make sure you know, you, you take time to feel. And that's what I, I go back to what the teacher said earlier. Is you can only feel if you make time to pause and reflect on where you are, what you're doing, and what you want for yourself in life as you walk. Right? So because... So interestingly, uh, um, PK, what I have gone into, you know, from being a teacher and building an entire education system that had IQ at, at the center right. of its right. model, right. and right. I used to, you know, embed EQ as much as possible, right. I'm, now, I'm now actually flipped it because I've understood that, you know, emotional intelligence in anything that we do, whether we're, because mm -hmm. if we're entrepreneurs, we're leaders, mm -hmm. right? Yes, we have to actually be able to move people passionately to action. And that only happens if we have a high amount of EQ. So connection, connection. connection. Yeah. 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 So, so it's way more important than, um, and, and, and therefore what I'm doing, which is Moonshot Conversations and the platform that I'm building Corroboree right. is all about getting parents and kids to understand exactly that, that, you know, right. connection, um, even when, even when we say, you know, can you find a way to contribute in the world? You want to contribute in the world because it makes you feel something, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So and, next... and, 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 and I just want uh, uh, to again leave this with the, with the parents and the, with, the, with the children is that this, this, if you ask me, is the biggest gift of this one hour, uh, really is that if there's one takeaway, I want them to uh, really go with the uh, teacher is that if kids can actually pause and say, how do I feel about this? 
I want to become a doctor. How do I feel about it? Rather than saying that, how, how will I be seen versus how do I feel? Uh, because the world that we live in is all about how will I be seen? Uh, there is no feeling in the seeing. It's, it, it's seeing is in the head, right? If, if the bunch of kids who are, and the parents who are listening to us today can actually take this, say that everything that you do, every action, if we take a moment and say, how do I feel about this? Uh, this conversation, this, this topic, this dream of mine, how do I feel? I think your life will be very, very different. One thing I can promise is your life is going to be very, very fulfilling. So, you know, one of the interesting things, a kid who was doing really well in school and who got top grades and everything and got scholarships into medicine. And, you know, in India, medicine is like right. being seen as the, uh, the mother came to me and she said, you know, my child's getting into the best scholarship courses for medicine, but she wants to be an architect. What do you think I should do? I said, well, it depends what you want. Do you want as a mother, uh, a, uh, you know, uh, a B grade doctor as a child? who is unhappy or do you want right. an A grade architect as a child right. who's happy right. because she feels that that's going to, you know, sort of empower her life in some way. So on that, um, you know, my last message to all parents is whenever you're going to act in any way for your kids, just think about, is this in the best long-term interest of my child? And you'll yeah. almost always know what to do in that situation. So we've been asked to leave the last few minutes open for kids to ask us questions, which is why we're here. So on in that, so I'm, I welcome. Um, I think we've got some students here. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Firstly, before I jump on to the questions, I would really like to thank both of you. I think the way you've given examples of your journeys to explain certain traits like handling failures or being resilient. I think those are the uh, key takeaways for the kids to understand that it is only struggles which will get them to the position where both of you are. I'm surely uh, thrilled to really, uh, uh, you know, look at how you guys have put across and what has the journey been to where you guys have come across. So we have two students with us. Uh, one is Mahik. Uh, so Mahik, you can go ahead and ask the question. Unmute and switch on your video and you can go ahead and ask ma'am the question. Lena, Lena, please. One of the things as entrepreneurs, we have to we have to question the status quo. Just because, you know, for decades we've been calling people ma'am and sir, it's something that the British Raj thrust upon us. They left our country, we threw them out, we should throw out the words ma'am and sir with it. Hi, Mahek. Hi, ma'am. Thank you so much for highlighting us. Lena and PK. Thank you, Lena and PK, for enlightening and motivating us with your experiences and knowledge. But my question to you is, what things or points or aspects we should keep in our mind when we are the first timer to implement an idea or a startup? Like when we are the first timer to implement some idea or start a startup in any sector. Can you give me some example of what you... Of like uh, if I have to start a fit, uh, in fitness sector, I have to start an app or a website for only men for teenagers to keep up with their health and fitness with, you know, keeping in mind with their studies and the busy schedule they are going through. Okay. I'll take it first or you'll take it first? Go on, go on, go on. See, he throws it to me. He, th he just... Google the ball to me, <laughs> so he gets some time to think about his answer. <laughs> so Mahek, firstly, um, as, as PK said, uh, first, if you can think about uh, and draw out maybe mind map, what difference is this going to make in the lives of the people you want to serve, right? Yeah. And what is unique about it that's not available somewhere else? Yes. I would start off with those two big questions, right? So what's going to be so unique about your what you're offering that's not available elsewhere, which means you do a lot of, you know, when I was building an app for preschoolers, I first did, uh, my team did days and days of research, looking at every single kid's app in the preschool uh, arena, what's free, what's paid for, what the good stuff is, what's missing. So before even coming to an understanding of what I wanted to create, I wanted to know what's out there, what's missing and where will our unique positioning be 
when we develop um, 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 you know, a product or a service, that's not available elsewhere. What will draw people to us? And what difference will it make in the lives of those who actually use it? So that's where I would come from, from the beginning. Also given the fact that, understand, I don't have a business background. I'm actually a teacher. I'm a teacher who, um, had, who had great uh, insights into what excites kids to learn and put that into an instructional design process. So even when I started my school, you know, before I started my school, I said, what's existing and what's missing? And why, will, why is it important that I exist? Why is it important? Um, uh, what difference will I make in the space? And I was very clear with the def definitions of who I wanted to be. So let me give you an idea. People who started after me, right? Okay. Built a greater, bigger businesses and more financial abundance in their businesses than I built, right? Yeah. But I was very clear about where my need came from. My need was to make an impact. My need was to create the benchmark. My need was to um, be the influencer for other people to change their minds yeah. about how they think about education and learning, right? So yeah. you need to know what it means for you as well. So there's, yeah. nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be financially abundant. And the thing is, finally, that when you are really passionate with your purpose, financial abundance seems to follow anyway. Yeah. yeah? Uh, but I didn't have a business brain, so it's not like I set up the, I understood the processes and the systems first. I actually went to the heart and the soul first of why, you know, would it matter if I didn't exist as a, as an, as a, as what a, a school that I was going, uh, sort of setting up. Yeah. PK, now you've had enough time to think. I, I, I think you answered very well, teacher. So I don't need to. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have another kid with us. Her name's Sadna. Uh, Sadna, you can ask your question. Um, hello to both of you, and thank you for being here. This has actually been one of my favorite sessions. And um, I have two questions. So that one Sadna, don't say that. Don't say that. PK will get a very big head if you say it's been one of your best sessions. And he won't be able to walk through his door. His head will okay. get that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just joking. Okay. That's, a, yeah, that's a beautiful background, by the way. Okay. Now this ask is you. my wall. <laughs> it is beautiful. It's a beautiful wall. In each of those hearts. Yes. Right? Write down what the connection of what you want to set up is going to be, the heart connection. And each, well, each thank of you the so much for that idea. And in each of the butterflies... Right? So you've got hearts, yep. butterflies, and flowers. In each of the butterflies, uh, write down how that will make you change as a human being. And in each, okay. of, and in each of the flowers, write down how you're go it's going to help you grow. Okay. Got that. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have two questions. Um, my first question is going to be based on what Sir said. He first said that... Um, Every day is going to be a storm and that, um, you know, entrepreneurship world is something that's something like something a big darkness. But when you look at the bright side of it, you do see that the sky is also dark and then you won't be able to see the storm if it's not dark. So my question goes upon that. Um, what if someone starts their um, journey, launches their project in, some, in a time where it's not going to be okay? Say, I'm starting my business now. It's not going to be okay. That's what everybody's going to say. But what do you think about that? So, uh, I didn't get your name, Nani. What's your name? <laughs> Sadna. My name is Sadna Shriram. Yeah, Sadna. So, let me just remember. So, uh, I said something uh, besides the storm. I said, life is an adventure, Sadna. Right? Uh, yes. If you wake up each morning, I get up, I'll do something, I'm, and Lena can, uh, teacher can actually watch this. I get up each morning saying, thank God I'm alive. One more day of adventure. And I've always been like this. There have been, been times I've actually forgotten that it, it was an adventure. I've, I've sat and said, my God, it's so dreadful. And I, I, and I overcome that the minute I say it's an adventure. The minute you become Jack Sparrow, life changes. Right, so uh, so it doesn't matter. There's there's never a perfect time, Sadna. Nothing in life is perfect. There will never be a day which is going to be perfect. Right, so right. Uh, when you, when you choose to start and you you know you have the desire to start, begin. Life will always open a new direction. So don't wait for a perfect morning. 
to appear. Just start and, and, and you'll evolve. You keep evolve. And like I said, if you fall, you'll get up and learn something new. So just, just have, just enjoy yourself. Have a party. It's an adventure. It's, a, it's, a, it's all paid adventure. So, so Sadna, I'll just add to what PK is saying is what PK is saying is that firstly, change the words in your head. Right. Right. So um, if you use the word difficult or you use the word challenge, it speaks to different parts of your brain. Right. Right. So use words that empower you, not words that disempower you. Use stories that empower you, not stories that disempower you. Right. So those, that's the, what, where I start. The second part of, uh, of the question you asked that I'd like to answer is, if your purpose is really strong and you get up every day and show up, right, you will reach there. When I started my first school, I had two choices. Everyone said, do you know what the uh, uh, parent consumer customer wants in a school? I had a choice to follow that route or I had a choice to know what's right for a child and to build that. To do the second, which is to do in my heart what's right for a child and to build that is a much slower start, right? I actually set the way for other people to have jump starts because I, set, I, I created the platform for that acceptance to happen. I started my first school with only 10 kids, only 10 wow. kids. And I started my first high school with only 12 kids, only 12 kids, right? I could have got disheartened, I could have got anything, but you just, if you are driven by a very strong sense of what you're doing, your intention is correct. It's like Paolo Coelho says, when your intention is correct and your purpose is correct, the whole universe conspires, right? In one of the moonshot conversations I did, I spoke about the reticular activation system. You know, it's the science behind the law of attraction. It's what coaches like, you know, um, Anthony Robbins, who um, Pika does a lot of work with, all these life coaches use the power of the mind, the reticular activation system to understand that. I go to watch people like Anthony Robbins to see what they're doing, to then go and understand the science and then to put it into my schools. Now, I no longer have schools, but the online platform I'm building, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I want to awaken your reticular activation system first. You have to know what you want. You have to know why you want it. So more important than knowing what you want, you have to know why you want it. And if you know why you want it and you believe in it deeply, it will happen. And you have to show up every day, of course, and take certain actions towards it. It's not like, you know, thinking about it and suddenly the dream appears, but it will happen, I promise you. Um, my second question also goes about what you just said now. So um, this is something that I did experience. Um, I've seen that a lot of restaurants have like spoons that are like, you know, um, easy for right handers to have. But then I find that like, you know, I have, I have a bunch of friends who are left handers actually. And they go to that restaurant and they're like, people, what am I supposed to do with this? And um, it's actually surprising to find that people actually say, you can, you can do whatever you want, but that does not happen. They're um, too scared to take risks. And even sometimes they're scared to even take healthy risks. So um, what do you think can change that? So firstly, let me go back to your spoon. You just found a great opportunity, an entrepreneurial opportunity to set up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you've just given it to the whole world. That's a different thing, but it's a great entrepreneurial opportunity you just, you know, you just spoke to. One of the things I tell the left-handers is there's a power of using your other hand. It's the power of jogging your brain. Um, you know, there's, there's this whole book I'm reading called uh, The Power of the Other Hand. It's actually getting your left hand to do things that waken up the other side of your brain if you're right-handed, right? So it's a reason why we tell kids like, you know, where your sock drawer is, if it's there all the time, shift it up. Tell your mom to move it somewhere else. Jog your brain to wake up, right? So if kids have been brought up without any ability to take risk, it will be a challenge before they kind of get there. But we're hoping through metamorphosis, uh, you know, through the things that Disha set up, through bringing people like, you know, PK and I on board to speak to you guys, to you, you know, uh, young adults, um, that you can understand that there is great upside to taking risk, right? So even now, you know, one of the greatest things is, you know, it's easier to take a risk when you've got nothing. 
Yeah. So once PK and I have built all these big businesses, we've created names for ourselves and we've sold those businesses. It's almost, you know, I had to wake myself up because I started thinking about, I don't want to, because I've already tasted success, right? So the second time around, I don't want to fail. I had to wake myself up. That you took risk the first time because you had no, nothing to fail. You have nothing to fail again. Just put that all aside and start all over again. Right? Because once you've created a name, you're scared of losing it. Once you've created a reputation, you can be scared of losing it. Once you've created abundance, in, uh, financial abundance, you can be scared of losing it. So it's the same for us the second time around as it is for you the first time around. Thank you so much. So we have just two more questions which have come on to the live uh, platforms which are streaming. So one is, uh, so the question is entrepreneurship is a team sport. So how do you create a cult culture of anti-fragility across your entire organization and not just yourself? And any of you could take it up. Teacher, okay. go on. You, you, you do a good job. So um, if you, so I used to do this thing called learning sprints in my organization. Every Friday, everyone would get lunch in their hands and we'd be like, and we'd do learning sprints. And the way I would do the learning sprints is the person that needed to learn something the most would actually be running that sprint. So if someone was uh, averse to change, I would coach her to teach everyone about why change is the only constant. And we'd run a whole workshop around that. And she'd be spearheading it. So wherever somebody's fragile nature existed, I would coach them. And, and as a coach, I don't mean push like a sports coach, but like a mentor coach, you know, sit with them and say, why do you think? So they'd have to go and do all the reading, the homework, and bring all that knowledge back. And then we'd actually create a workshop around, you know, whatever it is that they're resisting. So in, 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 instead of, you know, when, you, when, you, when, when somebody has resistance and you push against it, force creates even more resistance, right? What you have to do is you have to like kind of pull them along into the journey. So as a leader, firstly, I was very strong to communicate my why of existing again and again across the organization. And the second is through the learning sprints, everyone, wherever they were feeling fragile, would learn to overcome that because they would actually understand the other side of the coin. That's how I did it. Thank you so much. And the next question, I think this is the last question we have, is uh, what are the three principles or I would say our habits we should follow to become an anti-fragile entrepreneur on a daily basis is what the kids want to know. Go for it, PK. <laughs> right. uh, one, is to have a, uh, one is to have a large enough dream and a purpose you want to go out and achieve. Yeah, one, is to have, one is a dream. Uh, second is to make yourself... Uh, fit enough to be worthy of a dream. Dreaming is easy. All of us can dream, right? But how are you preparing yourself to be worthy of, uh, of the dream, right? So you've got, you got to be fit enough, you've got to uh, be disciplined enough to be worthy of, of, the, of, of, of the dream. And the last thing is to persevere, you know, to be relentless about, uh, about the stuff. So one is a dream, have a great dream. Second is to have the discipline to make sure you, you manifest your dream. And third is to persevere, okay, uh, uh, despite all the failures, despite all the challenges uh, to, to, to get what you want to get. And it's very easy but, uh, uh, when I say this, but that's the only three uh, possibilities. This, these are three steps for you uh, to become a very, very good entrepreneur. And it's easy, actually. If you apply your mind, you can get there. So from what Praveen said, see, unless, that, unless you have the dream and it's your own dream, right? If it's somebody else's dream, you cannot be intrinsically motivated. You cannot be driven by yourself to show up every day and persevere through all the failures and setbacks that happen. So it's really important for all parents who are watching to let kids have the dream that comes from themselves. They have a problem that they want to solve for the world or they have something that they want to offer the world that doesn't exist and they believe in it really strongly. So that means that they will persevere because you can't persevere at something you're not interested in. Right? So what Praveen said is like, perfect. You have to have your purpose, your why. And, and if, kids, yeah, if kids again want to watch Simon Sinek's um, TED Talk on why, it's a really powerful TED Talk. So you need to know your why first, your purpose first, before you think about your what and how and everything else. And he has a very powerful uh, conversation around that on uh, a very powerful TED Talk around that. Great. 
So I think that's a wrap to this conversation. And I think that was lovely to have both of you as, uh, with us today. So I once again would like to thank both of you. And there are a lot of questions popping up, but we're running short of time. So I'll surely drop them across through an email and you could reply back to us. Uh, and I would like to tell the viewers, uh, stay tuned. We'll come back next Saturday with some more exciting guests and some more exciting topics to keep you entrepreneurially charged. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.